I'm a feminist, but I got my eyelashes tinted at an airport. <laughs> and, and I feel 20% more capable of being loved. <laughs> I just feel more worthy of it, Deborah. It's, do you know? That is entirely understandable to me, and I feel terrible for admitting that. Yeah, I do. But I know exactly what you mean by that. Like, yeah. I just looked in the mirror and was like, don't take anything off anyone, Alison. Not with those eyelashes. <laughs> Did you feel like Jolene in the song Jolene? Yeah, I was seducing myself away from my shitty life. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, I'm a feminist, Bart. Yeah. I was just watching season three of The Handmaid's Tale. But what I was thinking, as I watched some of it on the way over on the plane on my iPad, was those hoods that they wear are great SPF protection. <laughs> I did think, because I'm really worried about my skin at the moment, because I think I just go out without anything and I forget to put sunscreen on. And I thought, if you always had that hood, I mean, that would... That's the job done. Yeah. Most of ageing is exposure to the sun, and it's nothing wrong with ageing. I think we need to be very clear about that. But there's also nothing wrong with not ageing. <laughs> You're ageing neutral. Well, I'm thinking of getting one of those hoods because people will think it's a political statement that I'm complaining about things like no abortion in Northern Ireland. When I come in, they'll be like, oh, solidarity, sister. But really, what I'm doing <laughs> is I'm keeping that fine line area around my eyes heavily protected. It's dual. It's dual. It's a political statement, which keeps me young. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's yeah. beautiful. I'm a feminist and from the Republic of Ireland, but I find the Northern Irish Mr. Tato more rideable. be unpacked for our global listeners no. who will not understand any of the words any of the words Mr. Tato just to be clear yeah I'll give you a background so 800 years ago <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry it's like I just love being on this island <laughs> God, okay, so this is, I, I went to Sainsbury's the other week and there's the ethnic food aisle in Sainsbury's and there's an Irish section of, uh, and they have, now, there's no license to sell Republic of Ireland Tato in England, so you only get the Northern Irish one, so I've been developing the horn for a while, but, <laughs> but, and I'll explain it for the people that are not at home in a second. Yeah. But when I lived in Ireland, could not give a fiddlers about TK Red Lemonade, right? Even if it was offered as a mixer for free, I'd be like, no, I drink it straight. Like. <laughs> but now, if I walk up to TK Red Lemonade, just under the biscuits that look like fannies, um, <laughs> we know the ones. In Australia, we call those iced vovos. Iced vovos. Yeah, which does sound a little vaginal. We call them uh, digestives. Uh, <laughs> don't, no, you don't. Digestives are those no. plain ones. What if your vagina the... looks like a digestive, you need to go to the doctor. <laughs> like, what are the what are the ones that we call iced vovos? Kimberly Mikado, coconut. Yeah. So. Do you know what? There's three different biscuits and I just know them all as Kimberly Mikado coconut creams. <laughs> I can never... It's like the Son, the Father and the Holy Spirit. You can't separate them. You can't. Sorry. So... Again. Back to the thing, right? What was the thing? It makes about me... About how you fancy Mr. Tato, but the Northern Irish No, Mr. just the Tato. Northern Irish one, because, like, the Republic of Ireland one, I believe you call it Free Stato here. <laughs> I've heard... So, free state is like a thing that I know. I'll tell you later. So, I'll tell you, you later. always do this to me. I'm whenever so sorry. We, whenever we do a show together in Dublin, all of the jokes are jokes about how funny it is that I don't understand the jokes. <laughs> but here's where I'm coming from with the Tato thing, right? So, the Republic of Ireland, Mr. Tato, he's just a yellow blob, right? With eyes and a suit. He basically looks like a potato going to court, right? <laughs> But the Northern Irish Tato, he's got features. He's got a nose. He's got a chin. He's got a jaw. 
he looks like Shrek as a human. Do you remember that? I found him hot as well. <laughs> Can I just say, Mr. Tato is a brand of crisps here. He is a, he's a brand chips. of crisps. Yeah. He's also our god. Uh, <laughs> there's a Ireland's only a fun fair, not fun fair, a theme park. We only have one theme park, and it's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what is that theme park? In County Mead. Tato Land, isn't that what it's called? <laughs> Tato Park! I'm sorry, I got it wrong. Tato Park. It's, it's basically, not. it's like Disneyland. Do you know the way they got Mickey Mouse? We've got a big spud. <laughs> That's not true, is it? Are it is. No, I swear on my life, I swear on my life. That's the only, Ireland's only fame Tato park. Tato Park? Yeah, Tato Park. I feel like you're all in on this. <laughs> it's a genuine thing, is it? Tato Park? Yeah. What's well, a potato theme park? Yeah. Where is it? Mead. You can get a big stick with a spiralised potato on it. It's like our version of Candy Floss. Um, they have a petting zoo there. Uh, very bad record, though, for animal rights. Oh, my God. I'm letting you know all about it, because they think they're getting free advertising. I'll tell it all. Like... <laughs> so, so, anyway, that's, that's basically what I'm yeah. trying to say. Um, is that I want to ride a potato in a suit. <laughs> Out of the Father and the Son and the, the Holy Spirit, which one of those do you fancy the most? Ooh. I don't know. I think the Holy Spirit is mysterious. Yeah. But I think the Holy Spirit is the John Ham of the triumvirate. Would you say so? Yeah, mysterious, like sort of odd background. You're not quite sure what's going on with him. Yeah. And he would have come inside of you before you'd even realised. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> what? I mean, mean, that's not consensual. So <laughs> I don't mean he would have entered you before you just, you'd realised. He's I an mean, early have, finisher, is yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, he would have sort of orgasmed. Do you think, has he or not? You know, like, I don't mean non-consensual. <laughs> I, don't mean, I don't know what I mean. <laughs> I mean, we're really going in hard before the abortion talk here, aren't we? <laughs> We really are. Um, <laughs> have you got any more? If they're going to arrest us, I'm going in deep. I, I, have, I do think that's what the Holy Spirit says. Uh, I, I do think, though, I do think that 90% of what we've said could previously, in previous years, have got us up on blasphemy charges. Yeah. At some point, we could have been killed for saying these things. Yeah. And isn't it lovely that we're now liberated and neither of us will be... Neither of us will be legally killed for saying these things. Jeez, I'd love if Arlene Foster saw this. You know? <laughs> Shall she, we? She's a very guilty feminist. <laughs> <laughs> Live from the Women's Work Festival in Belfast, the Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co-host Alison Spittle, and very special guest, Ronya Tenna. Kelly Turtle and Nola McKeever talking about The North is Next! This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. <laughs> I'm Deborah Francis White, with me is Alison Spittle and we're talking about The North is Next! Yeah! So just to contextualise this, if you're listening mm. internationally and you don't know what the North is next means, Alison, yeah. could you please explain it? Basically, um, abortion is illegal in Northern Ireland and there doesn't seem to be any political will to change that. Um, there's no current government in Stormont, which is like the devolutionised government. You see, I feel so bad being from the Republic of Ireland and trying to explain things from Northern Ireland because I feel like I'll get shit wrong, do you know? We've got three Northern Irish guests on, so we can get them to explain it much okay. better than we can. Yeah, well, basically, so there's no abortion allowed in Northern Ireland, and that's shit, and it needs to change. Then. Mm. Great. Okay. Yeah. All right, so that's what we're talking about today. We've got a Northern Irish comedian. Whee! 
um, we've got two incredible guests who are here to talk about abortion as well, so we'll, we will get on with that shortly. Shall we hear from our first stand-up comedian? Woo! <laughs> our first stand-up comedian is a local to Belfast. Uh, she's a wonderful comic. You're really going to love her. Put your hands together. <laughs> and make incredible, guilty feminists welcoming we're her organizers for Nola Makiva. the world everybody's listening out there the first thing I want to talk about choice if there's one thing the fascists and fundamentalists hate it's choice oh god no don't let people think for themselves so in Northern Ireland that's your choices really you've got choice or you've got fundamentalism isn't that right yeah. we know how to put the fun into fundamentalism no but choice choice I have to put my cards on the table from the beginning tonight and say I'm really crap at choice actually it actually scares me it overwhelms me a little bit years ago I, I found myself spent the whole of my lunch break when I was working in the city center I went round to Marks and Spencer's and I spent the whole lunch break trying to choose a pair of socks and I couldn't choose a pair of socks and I was telling my friend she said that's okay I can understand that you know all the choices the varieties the colors the patterns I said no they were all black four different pairs of plain black socks and I couldn't choose. It just terrified me, overwhelmed me. I'd be like, no, no, don't make me have to choose, take it away. You know, it'd be like somebody thrusting that second donut at you and you're going, no, no, take it away. Well, I say second, obviously, I mean ninth. <laughs> Which is probably, hating choice is probably why I became a vegan because, you know, if you're eating out, you don't even have to think about it. You never get a choice. Any vegans in the hall? There's probably more, but they're too weak to clap. <laughs> Yeah, I just need some B12. But you go out for dinner as a vegan, you go into the restaurant, a waitress comes over, gives you the menu, you say, I'm vegan, is there anything I can eat? And she'll always say, well, can I direct you to the back page of our menu? If you look down in the bottom left-hand corner to that tiny little box, <laughs> that's your vegan choice of the day. Vegan choice du jour. <laughs> and you look at the wee box and there's always one thing in it, something like concrete burger. <laughs> And you say, excuse me, there's only one thing. What's my choice? Take it or leave it. And she says, <laughs> so that's it. But I love it. I don't mind it. You know, it suits me rightly. I get to not have to make a decision. I don't have to be responsible. And I get to complain about it. Win-win. What's not to like? That's what we love in Northern Ireland. Not being responsible, but complaining lots of times. It's fantastic. You know, we're not the same. Margaret Thatcher once said very famously that Northern Ireland was as British as Finchley. Clearly that is a load of bollocks. Um, we speak differently, we've got a different accent, we use different words. I mean, for example, you, somebody out there might say armpit. I'm not quite sure why the word armpit leaps to mind when we're talking about Northern Ireland and a woman's right to choose, but there you go. They say armpit, what do we say? Oxter. Oxter, good Ulster Scots word. They say embarrassment, we say scundered, yeah. They say democratically elected functioning government, we say what the fuck's that? We haven't had one of those for over two years. We do have very old fashioned attitudes to women here. I mean, you know Alexa, you know that thing Alexa? We don't actually have it here. Seals here are very low because men here don't need a small electronic box in the corner to bark orders at because they've got a wife at home. <laughs> I really hate that. Anytime I hear men and boys barking orders at this subservient woman who sits in the corner, I get a fucking PTSD flashback to being brought up here in the 1970s. <laughs> Alexa, put the kettle on. <laughs> Alexa, what time's my dinner going to be ready? Alexa, find my slippers. Just once, I want all of us to rise up, led by Alexa, and say, do you know what? Get off your lazy, fat, misogynist fucking arse and find your own fucking slippers. Thank you. Have a good night. See you later. Bye. Nola McKeever, everybody. Hello, Guilty Feminists. It's Deborah Francis White, just letting you know that on the 14th of September, we are joining forces with the BBC Proms. That's right, it's the last night of the Proms, and I'll be joined by Jade Adams, and we will be talking to American mezzo soprano Jamie Barton and composer Erin Wallen. It'll be 2 30 pm at the Bite Hall, which is round the corner from the Royal Albert Hall, because it's only just gone on sale. Tickets are still available from guiltyfeminist.com. 
Global Pillage is back. There are dozens of fantastic shows at the London Podcast Festival, including The Guilty Feminist. But that's sold out, sorry. But one of them is Global Pillage, a diversity-based comedy panel show featuring me, Ned Sedgwick, Samo Wolf on Keys, and an amazing lineup of comedians, including Kima Bob, Alex Edelman, Steve Alley, and Celia AB. It's at 4:30 p.m. on Sunday, 8th of September. And you can get tickets now from King's Place. Dot co to UK. And you can also see me being interviewed by Jade Adams and Kerry Pritchard McLean about my favourite musicals. I can think of nothing better at a musical, also part of the London Podcast Festival. That's also on Sunday, the 8th of September, and that's at noon. If you find a third podcast you want to come and see, you can get 15% off your booking. Go to King's Place and find out more. Also on Sunday, 8th of September, I am interviewing Sarah Pascoe about her book, Sex, Power, Money. Sounds exciting, doesn't it? And that is at the South Bank Centre. And you can get tickets for that at southbankcentre.co.uk. It's at Queen Elizabeth Hall at 7.30pm. So if you want to join us all day, you would be so, so welcome. If you're thinking, but I'm not in London, I'm in New York City. Don't worry. Millie Thomas is bringing her show Dust to New York Theatre Workshop until the 29th of September. It's on right now. Trigger warning, it is about suicide. It's an incredible play, really wonderful, elating, funny, tragic, all of the things. You're going to feel all the feels. You can get tickets at nytw.org. And there is a podcast uh, where you can hear her talking about that at The Guilty Feminist. If you'd like to scroll back, it's Millie Thomas and it's nytw.org for tickets if you're in New York. Finally, we have merch. Go to guiltyfeminist.com and click on merchandise. We have t-shirts, we have hoodies, we have notebooks, we have mugs, we have tote bags, and I'm a feminist but we have aprons and tea towels. Our profits go into the Guilty Feminist pot for good things, which includes creative things, charity things, and also paying our ever-widening team of women who work for us backstage as the podcast grows. So please get in and buy some merch if you fancy some. And now, back to the podcast. Today, the campaigns manager for Amnesty Northern Ireland and a feminist activist working in the women's community sector in Belfast. Please welcome to the stage Gronya Teggert and Kelly Turtle. Thank you. Hello. Hi, my name is Kelly Turtle. Yeah, I do have paid work in the women's sector, which means I go out and try to kind of support grassroots women's groups who want to build campaigns, and I lobby on policy issues that affect women. And I'm also an activist myself with Belfast Feminist Network and Alliance for Choice. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, my name's Gronya Tigert. I'm campaigns manager for Amnesty International. I'm also a lifelong feminist, and shout out to my two mums who brought me up that way. Ah! Here they are in the second row. Um, I am ardently pro choice, unapologetic for it. The North is next. Yes. So, can you tell us a little bit about where we're at? It's hard to summarise this place sometimes, but for those of you not familiar with Northern Ireland, we have amongst the strictest abortion laws in the world. Mm. Our laws have the harshest criminal penalties in the whole of Europe. And we have um, several politicians, including our largest political party here, who would happily keep us that way. Uh, we're not accepting that. What we want is the decriminalisation of abortion, which means we take it out of the criminal justice system because abortion is a matter for each individual woman or pregnant person and their doctor, not police and judges the way we have it here in Northern Ireland. Yeah. Yes! Amazing, Kelly. Um, so th we've been campaigning on this issue for years. It's become quite, you know, focused on, in terms of the international spotlight recently. But groups like Amnesty and Alliance for Choice have been campaigning for many, many years. And we're at a place right now because of the referendum in the south and because of the successful overturning and uh, that that you vote. helped with, by the way. So thank you very much. Like oh, I have to say that. 
it was a really a really powerful time last year to be involved in that you know across the whole island and what was great about the referendum campaign was there was a fixed target you know there was an end goal and we suffer with not having that right now in northern ireland because we don't have this kind of um, thing that we can mobilise everyone around, you know, like a referendum, like a date when that vote is going to happen and that right. victory is going to be won because we just have this constantly moving target because we don't have a government here to lobby, so we're having to look to Westminster. Um, so we know that across the UK, anybody who's listening can really help by lobbying their MPs. We could lobby our own MPs, but they're not very good on this issue. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, the good thing about Westminster at the moment is it's got razor-sharp leadership. <laughs> and, I mean, you know exactly where to go. For example, you know who's running the country. That's oh, clear. Yeah. It's um, so stable. It's so, so strong and so stable. I mean, that's, I think, the main two things that I would say. Oh, it's strong. It's too strong. It's I mean, too stable. Thank yeah. God. Thank God we don't have chaos under Ed Miniband. I mean, that would have been just he, awful. He chaos. couldn't eat a bacon sandwich, sure, I mean, you know? If he couldn't eat a bacon sandwich, how could he have got us into this current situation? Yeah, um, I think every person that runs for leadership should be shown eating a bacon sandwich, and then you pick the best one. <laughs> you know? I mean, a vegan bacon sandwich. Oh, I, as I had backstage, that's what I had. I had a vegan BLT backstage. It was part of the rider at the limelight. There was loads of vegan sandwiches in the fridge. Isn't that good? Oh, I just saw the sandwiches, to be honest with you. They were, no, they were vegan. Oh. You accidentally had a vegan sandwich, Alison. Well, well, I feel great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, at the moment, because of dreaded Brexit, can I just say sorry about Brexit? Because I know Northern Ireland voted... Woo! Obviously, to not to Brexit. Um, as did Scotland. And if Westminster... Uh, hey. Hello, Scotland. Hello, Scotland. And if... Uh, an, it's like an, a uh, Eurovision. Scotland calling. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But I know because of Brexit, everything like this gets delayed. Nobody wants to be upsetting certain apple carts at a time when there's so much else going on because we don't have this referendum coming is there any way to get a referendum uh, no we don't want a referendum because unlike the south of ireland we don't have a constitution that requires one and mm -hmm. also we don't put rights up to popular vote in normal in normal circumstances um, they're universal and they belong to all of us but what we do have, yes, it's a total shit show, if I can say that at Westminster, obviously, at the minute, but things are moving, and actually, um, the relationship that the Conservative Party have with the DUP has actually put a spotlight on what we've been putting up with for all of these years. So actually, we've had an opportunity to actually build strong support across all of the political parties at Westminster. What we need is legislation where we can actually get this change, and of course, obviously, there's a delay there at the minute, but not just that, we're also fighting through the courts, so we're not waiting for the politicians with this. So there are a few court judgments that are coming up that I think will be game changers in this, that will put it squarely in the lap of the Northern Ireland Secretary of State and the UK government. And the sooner that happens, the better. Which, oh, brilliant. <laughs> Can we talk about, like, um, as a person from the Republic of Ireland, you hear of different court cases that happen up in North, like that lady that got ratted on by her two flatmates and that ended up in court and it was disgusting. And I just wonder, like, what cases are coming up now that will be game changers just for people that are listening? Like, Okay, so there is a mother being prosecuted at the minute for buying abortion pills for her daughter. Mm. Her daughter was in a very physically and emotionally abusive relationship and when she went to her doctor to be referred for counselling services, she was reported to the police and her medical files were passed to the police without her knowledge, without her consent. But the doctor reported her to the police? It was social services, yes, because of her age. So um, she was reported to the police. The mother was interviewed without a solicitor present. She didn't realise how much the law differed here to the rest of the UK. She disclosed everything that she had done and the Public Prosecution Service in Northern Ireland have said it's in the public interest to prosecute this mother. So we have a really grave situation where a daughter is being used effectively as a tool in her own mother's prosecution. That um, is coming up for judgment soon and it could even be that on a legal technicality that mother then faces a criminal trial and up to five years in prison. That's what we do to women in Northern Ireland in 2019. Yeah. 
So it's dire, like people do have to get involved. So people from the UK can like uh, uh, rally at their MP. What can people from the Republic of Ireland do? Is there any, can we donate? Like what can we do? What we do need is to maintain the momentum on the streets as well. So there is going to be a rally for choice on the 7th of September. So we want to see everybody in the room at that. Um, Where will that rally be? It's going to be taking place in the centre of Belfast, so we're still um, firming up all the details, but it'll be really well publicised on social media. And we've had brilliant support from the South over the past year of busloads of people coming up for other rallies that we've had on International Women's Day and other events, so we can keep on with that. And we're trying to do a lot of work in Alliance for Choice to change the culture as well, because... If we're really going to have a society where access to abortion is normalised, then we have a lot of conversations we need to have here because what happened in the South around the referendum was a huge public dialogue about this. We've never been able to have that in Northern Ireland. It's too tense because of the law and also we just have a very kind of contentious political discourse anyway because of the conflict. So we run a stall every Saturday in the centre of Belfast where we just speak to the public. Um, We've now got In Her Shoes Facebook page for the North in the same way that there was in the South. Um, So it's having those conversations as well and telling the stories and I share my own abortion story as part of my activism because I think we have to really break down all the misconceptions and so just creating that culture of acceptance and normalising it. We've just started doing a project with Amnesty International called uh, Truth to Power Hour. So every Friday at 3pm, you go to the Amnesty Twitter feed, the Amnesty website, and they'll give you an issue of the week for you to speak truth to power. So there'll be links where you can click through and speak to you know, the Polish government this week about an LGBT issue. There's somebody who's been arrested. She had a poster of the Virgin Mary with a halo that was a rainbow halo, um, like Pride, and they raided her house looking for something clearly and they said well this is offensive to religious people and they arrested her and now she could have two years in jail well I'm never going to Poland then <laughs> well are you not currently doing a show called Alison Spittle Mother of God yes yeah. <laughs> don't tour it to Warsaw I'm going to put that out there yeah. um, but if we put enough pressure on the Polish government will not want to die on that hill they won't so they will not put that woman in jail for two years I'm becoming increasingly aware how much power we have if we come in numbers because I want this to become a bridge building tool because the other day I shared something on Facebook someone took umbrage with something and we were arguing about nuance and clearly both on the same side but like well he was saying you shouldn't ever use the word fascism unless it's a fascist government and I was saying no I'm saying this is a fascist tactic and it was back and forth like this and then I just stopped because I thought I'm not interested in arguing with someone who disagrees with me for half a fucking hour when I actually could be on the Amnesty website finding another cause to find so I stopped and I just went we're clearly on the same side would you join me in Truth to Power Hour this afternoon, would you click on this link and would you share this? And then somebody else, before he could respond, came in and went, Deborah, you've got the patience of a saint and the optimism of a puppy dog, basically saying, this guy's not going to come around. And I was like, oh, don't ruin it. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. He might, he might. So I just said to this guy, the second guy, would you also join me in Truth to Power Hour? I didn't use him like as an ally, like, yeah, that guy's a loser. And they both came back and said yes. And I went to the first guy's wall and he'd shared it. So I'm wondering if we can all get behind Amnesty's Truth to Power Hour. It's come out of a project between Amnesty and the Guilty Feminist. And when we start to have these divisive conversations, find something, well, can we agree on this? You offer somebody a bridge. So it could even be, would you agree in this case, this individual has suffered because she couldn't have a termination. Would you agree with that? So you're not saying you're a bad, wrong person for not agreeing with abortion. You're saying, would you agree with this? Could you agree with this? Could you agree with this? Because the more we can find points of agreement, the more bridges we can build, the more likely we are to win people over. And I really feel like that's what we have to be doing now. 
I think in Northern Ireland here, because there was so much secrecy and silence and stigma around the issue for so long, actually when women started to speak out, that really changed things, particularly the political landscape. So I'm thinking of one person in particular, Sarah Ewart, who might be you know, known to many of you, who her pregnancy had a fatal diagnosis, so there was no prospect of that fetus surviving outside the womb. And when she spoke out and said, I had to go to London for this, you know, I had to travel for a termination, this is wrong, we should be able to get this, these services at home. That really challenged people to start to think about and understand this issue, not as a black and white issue. Our bottom line is that women pregnant people will always have reasons why they need to terminate a pregnancy and it's nobody's business but their own. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So across all the campaign groups, we're really clear now that what we're calling for is the decriminalisation of abortion. And actually that applies just as much in the rest of the UK as it does here because abortion still sits within the criminal law across the whole of the UK. The 1967 Act only provides a defence. So to meet international human rights standards which call for decriminalisation, they should scrap that whole piece of law from the 1861 Act. So that's what we're calling for because it would have a huge impact in Northern Ireland. We could then start to make regulations and put it in the healthcare bracket that it should always have been in. So we, I think we have to start educating a bit more about what decriminalisation means because people who don't like the sound of it, it can be quite a fear-mongering thing. It can make it sound like you're just talking about abortions for everybody all yeah. of the time. And Abortion it's not like mills, that. that's a big one they use. What, everyone will just rock up in the morning to an abortion mill every other yeah. Wednesday or something? It's like a Hovis advert, you know, you see the kid put on his flat cap and it walks up, <laughs> off to the mill, do you know? <laughs> that's the imagery they yeah. want to put forward because they want to dehumanise uh, women they never want to talk about individual cases yeah. because that would require empathy you yeah. know I'm not saying that they're devoid of empathy but I'm just saying like uh, from what it felt like with the referendum yeah. but uh, we need to pressure and it's so weird because it feels like it's the government in the UK that could fix this yeah. and yet I feel like you're forgotten yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, and it's great that, Deborah, you've brought the show here. And, like, you know, there's such... Because I did a gig in Belfast there about two months ago. It was all guilty feminists in there. I was like, why are you coming to a show at three o'clock, you know? Legends. And um, <laughs> only them, though, that came to the show. The rest of you are grand. Um, <laughs> I hope now if people listen to the podcast will not forget Northern Ireland and will fight like in any way that they can, you know, whether that's pressuring their government or um, getting a bus and bringing it up in September. Mm. Like I'm sure, because like he did it for us um, in May last year, so we need to return the favour to you. So thank you. Absolutely. It seems... It feels to me like such a fundamental human right, like more than even the right of water or a patch of land to stand on. If we cannot even decide what goes on inside our own flesh and blood, if this isn't ours to say what happens, how can we have a right to anything else? If someone has a right to inside of you. So is there anything else you want to leave on the stage tonight? What is it that we haven't asked you? What is it that you want us to know, want us to do, want us to say, want us to speak out? How is it that we can best help? What's the message we need to take away? Well, I want to say one thing, which is that this is in a context of lots of ways that women are left behind in Northern Ireland. We don't have any coercive control law here. We don't have proper domestic violence legal protection that you have elsewhere in the UK. Um, we... We don't have any childcare provision, so they don't want us to have abortions, but they don't want to support us to have children either. You know, so I think it would be good if we could kind of try and get some momentum around all of this, because this is misogyny central right here, and abortion is just one part of it. Kronia? I mean, yeah, all of that. And I suppose just to pick up a point that you mentioned, you know, just don't forget that we are completely isolated now is the only part of these islands with a near total ban. And people really need to understand that if you've been raped, if you're a victim of incest, if there's a fatal diagnosis, or if you just face a crisis pregnancy and you need a termination, 
This is just how far behind we are. So we're a part of the UK and on the island of Ireland as well. We deserve our equality. Yeah. We are not second class citizens. We will fight until we get there. And we will get there. Thank you. Um, thank you. <clears throat> thank Can you. I I don't know when to sit with a standing ovation. <laughs> Can I just ask you one thing as well? Uh, last year, there was a fundraiser for Nexus, which was providing counselling for people that have been sexually assaulted and raped. Does Belfast have a rape crisis centre yet, or where can we donate to help people that have been sexually assaulted? Well, we're in the process of getting one set up. There's a partnership of organisations that's being led by the Women's Aid Federation here, and they brilliantly were able to get funding from the ROSA, um, is it called the Justice Fund, which essentially is money that was drawn down through the Me Too campaign. So some of the brilliant women actresses and sort of the public eye who fundraised around that whole Me Too Time's Up movement have been able to bring a really great amount of money into Northern Ireland to set up a new rape crisis centre. The volunteers are trained, it's ready to go, and it's going to be operating very soon. Brilliant. Wow. Amazing. Because I was just going to ask if we could do, like, because a Lance for Choice is, is currently fundraising and we sell merch and ship merch to all over the world, so it's great to take that message with Brilliant. you. Brilliant. But also I just wanted to shout out to all the incredible a Lance for Choice volunteers who do the stall, who stand there every week and put themselves yeah. on the front line, who knock doors during the referendum. There's so many brilliant people involved with the Lands for Choice who just do it for the sheer passion of wanting to change this. No, it's incredible. It... <laughs> I was just going to say very quickly as well, the incredible artist Mazer, who had the iconic repeal mural in the South when we had the referendum, he has reworked that artwork for the North as well. And Amnesty, we're going to be bringing out a range of merchandise on that too. So Wonderful. watch this space. Amazing. <laughs> What's the website that we can get the merch from? I'm pretty dot sure com. it's alliance for the number four choice.com. Alliance for choice.com, four being the number four, and amnesty.org.uk. Amnesty.org.uk. You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Brotzels White, guest car host Alison Special, and our very special guests, Grania Teggett and Kelly Turtle, and Nola McKeever. The recording engineer was Chris Morrow, the music was by Mark Hodge, and the producer was Tom Selinski for the Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Luke at Phil McIntyre Entertainment, and everyone at the Limelight, as well as all of you for listening. More information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. Cassette recorder. Oh, right, sorry. Isn't that how you listen to your podcast on a cassette recorder where you press play? I don't know what you know about Ireland, but we <laughs> have moved on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean you. I was dating myself. Oh, sorry. Not, not, not Northern Ireland or Ireland. Sorry. Um, it's just anytime I hear anything out of your accent, I feel colonised. <laughs> <you know? laughs> in Australia and Alison was born in England. <laughs> so I'm... who's the coloniser? My daddy, all right? <laughs> We've all got daddy issues. <laughs> but unless your daddy was Winston Churchill, there are no excuses. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is taking a turn. I'm yes. going to say... Hello Melbourne Guilty Feminist listeners, if you are in Melbourne on the 10th of September, I, Alice Fraser, am doing a show, Savage, at the Malthouse Theatre, 10th of September, it's called Savage, and it's a solo stand-up comedy show that talks about tragedy, and whether you can do comedy about tragedy or not. Please come and find out on the 10th of September at the Malthouse Theatre in Melbourne. Bye.